Tonight on PBS News Weekend, a look at the surge in support for crisis pregnancy centers across the country since the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade. Then, with only two remaining northern white rhinos in the world, a potential scientific breakthrough may help save the species from extinction. We are in the midst of an extinction crisis, and we should be looking for all of the different potential tools that might be out there for us to be able to help species that are alive today and in danger of becoming extinct to avoid that fate. And how a grieving mother was inspired to create her own organization to provide bereavement care for families and children. Major funding for PBS News Weekend has been provided by... Cunard is a proud supporter of public television. On a voyage with Cunard, the world awaits. A world of flavor, diverse destinations, and immersive experiences. A world of leisure and British style. All with Cunard's White Star service. and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. And friends of the NewsHour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm John Yang. Tonight, U.S. officials say Israeli leaders have essentially agreed to a proposal for a six-week ceasefire in Gaza and the release of some hostages. All that's left is for Hamas to agree to it. Talks are to resume tomorrow in Cairo. In Gaza, three U.S. C-130s dropped 38,000 meals onto the beaches of southwest Gaza. More deliveries are expected in coming days from the United States, Egypt, and Jordan. And in the Red Sea, a ship hit by a Houthi missile two weeks ago has sunk, the first vessel to be destroyed by Houthi attacks. The Belize-flagged Rubimar was carrying tons of fertilizer. Yemeni officials called the sinking an unprecedented environmental disaster. Fire and ice in two states tonight. Firefighters in Tex the Texas Panhandle are battling the largest wildfire in the state's history in increasingly difficult weather conditions. Since Monday, the fire has killed at least two people, scorched 1,700 square miles of prairie, destroyed as many as 500 structures, and killed thousands of cattle. In the mountains of Northern California and Nevada, the biggest storm of the season has closed 100 miles of Interstate 80 and knocked out power to tens of thousands of homes. Up to 10 feet of snow is forecast for higher elevations. Donald Trump won the Missouri Republican caucuses today, continuing his string of early contest victories. In Michigan, Trump won all 39 delegates awarded by today's state party convention. Idaho Republicans hold their caucuses tonight. Tomorrow begins a three-day series of 17 contests, including Super Tuesday, when almost two-thirds of all delegates are up for grabs. Trump's last major rival, Nikki Haley, has yet to win any primary or caucus. And a self-described geriatric starlet, fashion icon Iris Apfel has died. She was a textile expert, an interior designer, and a late-in-life fashion model in her 80s and 90s with an eye-catching and audaciously clashing style. She was the subject of several museum exhibitions, a documentary, and major ad campaigns. She even lent her expertise to the White House working on restoration projects under nine different presidents. Iris Apfel was 102. Still to come on PBS News Weekend, scientific breakthroughs give hope to save the northern white rhino from extinction. And a brief but spectacular take on the importance of bereavement care. This is PBS News Weekend from WETA Studios in Washington, home of the PBS NewsHour, weeknights on PBS. 
crisis pregnancy centers provide counseling and other prenatal services from an anti-abortion perspective. Their supporters say they help ensure that pregnant people know the risks of abortion. Advocates uh, of uh, abortion rights say the information they provide can be misleading or have no scientific basis. As Ali Rogan reports, there's a debate over federal aid for these facilities. In the United States, so-called crisis pregnancy centers are nothing new. The first one opened in Hawaii more than 50 years ago. But after the Supreme Court ended the constitutional right to an abortion, these largely unregulated centers have seen renewed support and attention. According to analysis by the group Reproductive Health and Freedom Watch, which supports abortion rights, anti-abortion pregnancy centers brought in at least $1.4 billion in revenue in the 2022 fiscal year. That includes at least $344 million in government grants. There are an estimated 2,500 such pregnancy centers around the country. In comparison, about 800 clinics providing abortion care were operating before the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Carter Sherman is reproductive health and justice reporter for The Guardian. Thank you so much, Carter, for joining us. Tell us a little bit about how these centers work. What sorts of services do they provide? So the point of a crisis pregnancy center, which is often known as a anti-abortion center or even just a pregnancy center, is to convince people to continue their pregnancies. And they offer services like pregnancy tests. They sometimes do medical services like ultrasounds. They will also give out goods like car seats or strollers. Now, the thing is that even when they do provide these medical services, many of these facilities are not actually medically licensed. So they are not burdened by the kind of limitations that medical providers face. The other thing about these centers is that they are often staffed by volunteers. They're usually faith-based. And so that creates issues for courts that might be looking to further regulate them because judges are very wary of treading on these centers' First Amendment rights. So when someone does enter one of these crisis pregnancy centers, what sort of interactions are they likely to have with these volunteers? I think the interactions can really vary a lot, but something that has come up again and again from people who go into these centers is that they walk in not necessarily knowing that they are not in an abortion clinic. You know, these centers, according to abortion rights supporters, will oftentimes set up shop very close to an abortion clinic. They will have names that include words like birth or choice or the sort of things that we tend to hear from abortion rights supporters. And in reality, again, these are centers that are trying to convince you to continue a pregnancy. What sort of people do centers like these target? These centers offer uh, usually free services, and so that can be really appealing to people who are low income. And we do know that, at least prior to the overturning of Roe, most people who get abortions are low income because it is so difficult for people to afford pregnancies in this country. So why are these centers receiving more funding now? Well, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the anti-abortion movement has really framed crisis pregnancy centers as the place to go for women who might otherwise have wanted an abortion but are now in a situation where they have little choice but to give birth. And state governments, particularly the governments of red states, have really agreed with that logic. We know, for example, that since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, at least 16 state governments have sent more than $250 million worth of taxpayer money to programs that support crisis pregnancy centers. I think in the coming years, we are likely going to be seeing even more funding. So tell us a little bit more about the breakdown of what we do know now about how these crisis centers are getting their funding. Is it coming from the federal government, state and local governments? What does that allocation look like? It can really be a mixture. Some of the money that flows from the government to these crisis pregnancy centers is ultimately from the federal government. We know that the state governments will take the money that the federal government gives them for things like temporary assistance to needy families and direct that towards programs to support crisis pregnancy centers. And there's now a debate happening between the White House and Congress over whether temporary assistance for needy families should continue to be used for uh, crisis centers. What is the status of that debate? Temporary assistance for needy families is a program that we would tend to understand as being a part of welfare. It is money that the federal government will give to state governments that they can then disperse for various aims to help families that are in trouble. And one of the goals of Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, is to help prevent out-of-wedlock pregnancies. Now, the Biden administration has said that, you know, by the time someone comes to a crisis pregnancy center, they already suspect they're pregnant. 
And so it's actually not an aim of a crisis pregnancy center to prevent an out of wedlock pregnancy because the pregnancy has already occurred. The Biden administration introduced this rule. The Republicans in the U.S. House have responded with legislation that would block HHS from effectively making that rule. That bill did pass the House, but given Congress's general state of inaction and polarization right now, it is very unlikely that that bill will ultimately become law. Right. Likely something we're going to see continue in state houses, though. Carter Sherman, reproductive health and justice reporter for The Guardian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. The northern white rhino is one of the world's biggest land mammals and one of the most endangered. Only two are known to be alive, both female. But scientific breakthroughs are raising hopes for saving the rhino and perhaps even bringing other animals back from extinction. This report is part of our series, Saving Species. When the last known male northern white rhino in existence, named Sudan, died in 2018, it seemed the future of the entire species died with him. Like many endangered species, their population has been devastated by human activity, widespread poaching and civil wars in their native Central Africa. Today, only two females remain, Najin and Fatu, both living in a conservancy in Kenya. But a recent scientific breakthrough has raised hopes for the northern white rhino's survival. We achieved together uh, something which was uh, not believed to be possible. Thomas Hildebrandt leads a team that successfully implanted a rhinoceros embryo into a surrogate mother. Until now, a tricky proposition giving the rhinoceros's two-ton size. The embryo and mother were southern white rhinos, a close relative of the northern subspecies. What we had to do is mimicking nature, and to learn from nature and mimicking it. And that worked quite well, and I, I never lost my, my trust that we will be successful. Now the team plans to use northern white rhino eggs and sperm that was harvested years ago from living male rhinos to continue the species. Because of age and health problems, neither Najin nor Fatu are able to carry pregnancies, which last about 16 months. So the embryos will again be carried by southern white rhinos. Hildebrand hopes a female can give birth to a calf within the next two years in order to preserve a crucial element that can't be replicated in a lab. We want to save this social heritage, and therefore we need a little calf which can learn the language from these last two uh, of their kind. The genes are important, yes, but behavior is something which also needs to be transferred. Otherwise, you, you, you end up with a nutrient, an animal which do, does not know what it actually is. But the northern white rhinos conceived this way won't have the genetic diversity needed to sustain a healthy population. So Hildebrandt and his team are working with a U.S.-based genetic engineering firm called Colossal Biosciences to use stem cells and gene editing technology to bridge the gap. If you want to reintroduce these uh, individuals to the wild, they should have a variety of genes to fight against diseases, environmental factors. So there should not be an inbreeding group. It should be a healthy genetic population. It is a quite holistic approach, which uh, will take maybe decades to fulfill it. However, it is a very pioneering concept, which gives a lot of hope for critical endangered species. Other scientists are using genetic technology in an attempt to reintroduce, or de-extinct, the dodo bird. The dodo was first seen around 1600 on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. It became extinct less than 80 years later due to deforestation, hunting, and destruction of their nests by animals introduced by Dutch settlers. Beth Shapiro has spent 25 years studying the dodo. She's an evolutionary biologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and an advisor to Colossal Biosciences. I became increasingly captivated by trying to figure out what it was about the dodo that made it so susceptible to becoming extinct, um, but also really to learn more about this iconic species so that we could potentially just really bring more attention to the fact that people are causing extinctions today. Shapiro says the reintroduced dodo won't be exactly the same as the pre-extinction birds. 
identical copies of things are never going to happen, but that's not the way evolution works anyway. If we think about de-extinction in a logical, ethical, ecologically sustainable way, it can't be this purest ideal of what de-extinction means. Instead, it has to be this creation of something new that's adapted for the, for the habitat of today and yet can potentially fill this, this void. In 2000, Shapiro took DNA samples from the only known surviving soft tissue of a dodo housed in Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. That led to the discovery that the dodo's closest living relative is the Nicobar pigeon found in parts of Southeast Asia. Using another dodo DNA sample from Copenhagen's Natural History Museum, Shapiro and her team were able to announce in March 2022 that they had sequenced the dodo's entire genome. If we want to know what makes a dodo unique, we have to have the whole nuclear genome sequence, the whole genome sequence, which we can then line up next to the genome sequences from other birds on a computer and start to look for the differences between those genomes. Because of the intricacies of the bird's reproductive system, one cannot clone birds. So one of the greatest technological hurdles in resurrecting a dodo will be to come up with some other way the Nicobar pigeon will provide the host cells and the genome for engineering. An important step, because we can't make millions of changes in a cell if we're going to change a Nicobar pigeon cell to being a dodo cell, is to figure out which of those millions of differences are actually important to making a dodo look and act like a dodo. Why are scientists making all this effort to resurrect extinct animals like the dodo and propagate threatened species like the northern white rhino? We are in the midst of an extinction crisis, and we should be looking for all of the different potential tools that might be out there for us to be able to help species that are alive today and in danger of becoming extinct to avoid that fate. These tools that we will develop on the path to de-extinction have immediate application to modifying the genomes of species that are alive today, potentially to help these organisms adapt to their rapidly changing habitats. They are ex uh, at the brink of extinction, not because they, they lost an evolution, because of us, or because of human activity. We poach them down to extinction. We destroy their habitats. And I think science can provide a new alternative. We have to live in harmony with nature, and we have to make a responsible decision how to exploit resources and restore these resources. Otherwise, uh, there is no science which can save the human civilization. Trying to undo some of the harm of human activity. After experiencing her own personal tragedy, Joyelle Mulherin founded Evermore, a nonprofit organization that seeks to improve the policies and practices surrounding bereavement care. Tonight, she shares her brief but spectacular take on why every loss matters. Our daughter's name was Eleonora. Eleonora was, at least to me, a very special person. When she was here, everyone wanted her to die quickly hospice wanted her to die quickly. The funeral homes, they would say to me, Joyal, do you think that she'll die before she weighs this or before she's won? Because if she does, then I'll broker you a better deal. The systems around us failed. And I thought it was my fault. And it wasn't until years later that I discovered that it wasn't my ineptitude. The systems are simply not there for families. After Eleanor died, I just had this intuition that something else needed to exist for bereaved families, but I didn't know what it was. And so I decided to quit my job and I started, frankly, walking the sidewalks, talking to people in Washington, D.C. about their life experiences. Evermore is a nonprofit dedicated to making the world a more livable place for bereaved people. Our grief is as unique as the relationships we hold. Bereavement, however, is systematic. Most people don't realize that being exposed to death or bereavement itself is actually associated with many other public concerns and emergencies. Teen pregnancy, dropping out of school, substance misuse, self-harm, violent crime, incarceration, suicide attempts, suicide. 
and premature death due to any cause. There are stunning statistics around um, really areas of concern that keep me up at night. Um, one of those is that as many as 80 to 90 percent of incarcerated youth experienced a death event just prior to being incarcerated. We are incarcerating grieving children in America. If I go to Capitol Hill and say that, people will be stunned. If I say that in inner city, mothers will be like, where have you been? Of course that's true. The first thing that I would say to people, you're not alone. You and your person that you lost, they matter. They matter terrifically. For policymakers, this isn't a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is an issue that touches every person at some point in their life. And there are many, many things that I believe we can do together to make the world a more livable place for bereaved people. My name is Joyelle Mulherin. This is my brief but spectacular take on why every loss matters. And finally tonight, we'd like to show you some of the 100 or so new species scientists believe they discovered amid the underwater mountains off the coast of Chile. They were found using an underwater robot capable of diving more than 14,000 feet. More than just enriching scientists' understanding of ocean life, researchers say it demonstrates how the Chilean government's ocean protections are bolstering biodiversity and providing a model for other countries. This unknown species of sea toad looks like something Dr. Seuss might have created. It was found under more than 4,500 feet of water. Behold the beady-eyed gaze of a squat lobster resting in coral about 2,200 feet below the surface. Just before this member of a rarely seen family of whiplash squid had its picture snapped, it squirted ink, perhaps a reaction to seeing an alien-looking object alongside it more than 3,600 feet down. Among the other species, researchers found glass sponges, deep sea corals, and urchins. Scientists say identifying them all could take years. With about 70% of the Earth's surface covered by oceans and only a fraction of it having been explored, who knows how many more unknown and unusual creatures have yet to be discovered if their habitats can be preserved. Now on our YouTube channel, Nick Schifrin on the digital series PBS News Weekly provides a detailed look at the multiple storylines coming out of the Israel-Hamas war. All that and more is on the PBS NewsHour YouTube channel. And that is PBS News Weekend for this Saturday. On Sunday, the growing phenomenon of AI companions, bots that can be a friend, even a boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm John Yang. For all of my colleagues, thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow. Major funding for PBS News Weekend has been provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.